listening to Pre-Market Prep. I'm Brianna Valeski with my co-host Joel L. Conan. We're joined by Tim Melvin. He's a deep, deep value investor, a market by Maven, as well as the author of the Tim Melvin Deep Value Letter. Tim's a 27-year veteran of the financial services and investment industry. Thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing today, Tim? Just doing fantastic down here in, uh, in Central Florida. A little warm and rainy, but uh, that's better than the cold we used to put up with up up north. I guess you guys are getting a little warm weather up there for a change, too, aren't you? It's been hot and humid, and I think we're not used to it because we're used to our cold weather up here. But you mentioned you're having a ball with some of these small bank earnings this morning. What are you looking at, and what are you seeing? Okay, well, let me just, I'm just going to give you a couple headlines without the bank name, and then we'll talk about a couple that I, that I want to talk about. But some it. of these are too small to put on the radio, actually. But here's one up 208%. Here's up, earnings up 55% year over year. It's just The small banks are really in a sweet spot right now. The credit problems are continuing to move into the rearview mirror. So reserves are coming back into earnings, but they're seeing some increased loan demand, particularly on the commercial side, that's really driving asset and earnings growth. So I've got a couple here I want to talk about this morning, if that's okay, that I think are just really stand out as excellent stocks at great prices or a real buying opportunity here. Uh, the first one's Eagle Bank Corp of uh, Montana. Now uh, The symbol there is EBMT. They released earnings last night. Earnings doubled year over year. They approved the dividend hike. They announced a new stock buyback. I mean, this is just a little bank with, uh, you know, 13 branches, about $583 million up in Montana, uh, doing very well as Montana is economically pretty strong, but they have almost no exposure to the energy or shale drilling industry up there. So it's just kind of organic uh, business growth and the bank's really benefiting from it. Tim, uh, on a, a quick side note, have you always followed the banks or what kind of got you into looking at them in particular? Because a lot of people, especially you mentioned before we got live on the show, a lot of people are hyper focused on some of these uh, hot tech stocks right now. But you're you're just totally zeroed in on these small banks. Why is that? Well, you know, back and I'm going to go all the way back to right after the SNL crisis in the early 90s. Okay. I, I, switch, I switched firms from a large wirehouse, Dean Witter. Uh, to a very small firm in Annapolis, Maryland. And it's a great little shop, and we peddled stocks and bonds. We weren't asset gatherers or financial planners. We were actually stock brokers. So that was, you know, nobody's a stock broker anymore. <laughs> um, but there was a guy in the office. He was an older gentleman, and he was always the last one in. He got in about 9.28 in the morning just before the market uh, opened. And at 4.01, he was gone. And he was the last known practitioner of the daily three martini lunch. And the man was never late for happy hour in his life. But he made a ton of money. Just, I mean, he had the condo in town, the beach house, everything. And I couldn't figure it out because I was working my butt off. Yeah. And uh, here's this guy making all this money, working as little as possible. So one day I grabbed him and I said, look, what is it you're doing? He said, well, you know, our firm makes a market in all these little bank stocks. I said, yeah. And he said, well, I don't know much about the stock market and the bonds and all that. And I don't really care. Here's what I know. These little banks are money machines. And when you look at them right now, they're down, you know, trading between 25 and 50 percent of book value. But they weren't involved in any of the activities that caused the SNL crisis um, to occur. So they're all going to get taken over. So I'm just buying them for my clients. And I sat down and I thought about it. A, that made a lot of sense. B, I love the idea of making more money working less. So I got real involved in the sector, and uh, it worked out exactly, as he said, by the way. Over the next nine years, the small bank and thrift indexes went up by a factor of 10 as they all took each other over. Um, and to this day, I mean, if I can find a small bank with a solid balance sheet and loan portfolio, and then as a bonus, if there's an activist or bank stock specialist involved, my odds of making money are tremendous. My ads of having to worry about Facebook, Twitter, Greece, the Ukraine, they're pretty small. They don't really <laughs> impact me. Hey, that's there's your case for small banks, guys. Uh, Tim, what <laughs> else is on your radar this morning? Well, here's one. It's back uh, Severn Bank Corp. This is from my uh, hometown of Annapolis, Maryland. Just a great little bank. It's a one, uh, maybe it's a two branch bank now. I think they opened a second one. But, you know, Annapolis is. Um, Get the, the real estate market can get quite overheated because it's a very historic town. There's a lot of money there. You could get a lot of New York and uh, uh, buying down there when times are hot. So in the credit crisis, the Apple area real estate got hit pretty hard, and so did the bank. Um, but this is run by one of the oldest families in the Annapolis, Maryland area, the Hyatt family. Um, Ellen Hyatt is the CEO of the bank. 
but his dad and his grandfather have all been in the real estate and, and uh, development business in Annapolis for over 100 years. They know the market. They know the people. Uh, they're very smart guys. They came out with their earnings in the past week, doubled over the first quarter, reversed a loss from the year ago period. And this thing's sitting here trading 85 percent of book value so if you look out three four five years as you know the economy continues to get better the annapolis area real estate market gets a little bit better uh this stock could easily double or higher and in the meantime my sleep tight factor at night is huge with this stock because there's no high frequency guys there's no hedge funds moving in and out of the oh, stock yeah. so um you just based on the fundamentals it's too cheap it should go higher over time Tim, you also mentioned you wanted to talk about real estate, and you're looking at Brookfield Property Partners. What are you seeing in this? Hey, well, Brookfield Property came out and with their first quarter earnings, um, and management estimate of net asset value per share was over 28 bucks. Now, they're connected with Brookfield Asset, BAM, um, and this is just a collection of just world-class real estate assets. Um, they own a significant portion of the skyline in uh, New York City, for example. They have industrial properties. They have hotels. If they, it's commercial real estate around the world, they've got it, and um, they've got excellent management team. Uh, pays a nice little dividend, but you're buying some world-class commercial real estate at a huge discount to the underlying net asset value. Anytime I can do that, I'm, you know, I'm pretty interested. What's the symbol on that one? BPY. Oh, okay. BP Boy Paul Yellow? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And as I said, they're, they're affiliated with Brookfield Asset Management. Uh, they're a great asset manager uh, on their own right, and they primarily do real estate infrastructure assets, things like that. And this is their commercial real estate uh, investment opportunity. And I just think it's it's a tremendous collection of assets at a nicely discounted price. You're getting 5.18%. Um, so I just, as a long-term holding, I think it's perfect. All right, Tim, moving on here. First of all, I have a huge compliment here coming from uh, Dennis, my partner. I know you've been on with him a few times. He says, I love Tim's picks. I buy them. So <laughs> he's pretty good. He, he doesn't listen to many people, but uh, there's a ringing endorsement coming from my partner, uh, Dennis. Tim, oh, well, thank you, Dennis. I wanted to ask you, I recently saw an interview. You interviewed the CEO of Sunshine Bank Corp. Can you kind of recap that for our audience a little bit? Yeah, that was actually just yesterday afternoon. That's a small bank uh, right down the street from me. It's in Plant City, Florida. And the bank is really doing very well. They're focusing on the corridor from um, Orlando to Tampa, which although it's a miserable drive on I-4, is actually an area that's seeing quite a bit of economic growth right now. And they're very well positioned to uh, take advantage of it. And they've done something neat. They were a thrift. Okay, They uh, did their mutual conversion back in 2014. And as a thrift, they had prim primarily done the one to four uh, family um, um, residential lending. They got out of it but in a really neat way, they uh, are farming out their single family mortgage to mortgage brokers and mortgage banks and just taking the commission and booking that profit. The lending that they're doing and taking into the bank's portfolio is all commercial in nature. So they just bought another bank, Community Southern, just closed on that, that doubled the size of the bank and really made them a significant um, the commercial lending presence in this part of Florida. And now they just bought two branches over in Bradenton and Sarasota um, that are also going to make them a, a, a greater commercial presence and a better deposit presence in the region. So I also was reading an article this morning, and I know you obviously by looking at banks, you're looking at book value right now. And it was an article about seven big banks that are trading under book value. Now, I know you're really not interested in big banks, but maybe some of these might have shown up on your radar. A couple of them that I saw, I mean, of course, there was Bank of America hit the list, Citigroup hit the list, but I also saw Regions Financial Corporation and Zions Bank Corporation. Do any of those show up on your radar if they are trading below book value? They do. Uh, they're both right around tangible book value. We were real big, uh, particularly in regions uh, in the 2009-2010 period. Okay. Uh, uh, because the big regionals like this, like regions, like Key, like Huntington, 
were trading at huge discounts to book value at that point in time. <clears throat> gotcha. We were picking them up at 70 to 80 percent of tangible book. And when you went through, yes, they had some loan problems, but they hadn't done any of the toxic stuff that the bigger banks had done that caused the crisis. They had collateral issues and we felt pretty confident that those would work out over time. And they didn't. To be honest, we made just an absolute ton of money in those stocks. And still, you know, Regions is a very well run bank. Uh, looking at the multiples, it's not particularly expensive. If I wanted exposure to the uh, to the larger regionals, then regions would actually be a pretty solid pick. Well, we're hitting the conclusion of a two-day Fed meeting today, and so we're going to see an FOMC statement. Uh, any take on interest rates? Are you feeling bullish or bearish? Is CN1 this year, not CN this year? And if so, how is it going to affect these small banks that you like to watch? Okay, first off, you know, when I talked to Louis Navalier a few months ago, he said, you know, if you just look at the economics of it, and remember, Louis used to work for the Fed. Uh, he's a very brilliant guy on the economic outlook in addition to being a solid stock picker. Uh, he told me that, you know, they'll never be able to just economically justify a raise. And Louis really meant never, because when he goes through and tears the statistics apart, he thinks the economy is far worse, particularly the jobs picture, than the numbers show. Having said that, I think the Fed's put itself in a bit of a political box here. Um, the market expects an interest rate increase this year. They may give them one um, just uh, for appearances, but there's not going to be any steady meeting after meeting interest rate increase. It would break the back of the economy. Um, if you really dig apart the numbers, particularly, again, on the job side, this is not, this is not a great economy. Uh, by any stretch. I call it better than it was, but a long way from good. So you may see them throw the market a bone and raise 25 basis points, but it's going to be a one and done. It, it has to be. September? You looking for September? Or? Nah, nah, December. Okay. All right. There, there's, there's, there's nothing in the data anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That where you could say, look at this big number right here. We need to raise rates and slow this stuff down. There's no data anywhere that says that. Now, having said that, all the small bankers I know, they're sitting around doing voodoo chants and lighting candles hoping for higher interest rates because that's going to raise their net interest margin, and they'll make more money as rates go higher. Unfortunately for them, they're not going to get it. That's actually great news for me because it's going to force a lot more of them to put their bank on the auction block uh, in the second half of 2015 and 2016. Okay. Um Tim, uh, you know, you know, I'm from Monroe, Michigan, and you've mm -hmm. talked uh, talked about Monroe Bank and Trust before. It's uh, it's been around since Custer uh, in Monroe. When uh, Custer's left, he said, uh, "Don't do anything until I get back." And uh, <laughs> they, they had, took him seriously. They they took him seriously here. Just hanging out seems immune to the market here. Five eighty, five ninety level. Uh, what you take? What's the book value on this thing? Uh, the book on that, we're at about 94% of book value right now. It's okay. about 6.17 uh, uh, is the book value per share. You know, it's, it's, again, it's just a quality little bank. They had some horrible problems uh, during the credit crisis. And, you know, being right there outside Detroit didn't help a bit. Um, but, you know, 25% year-over-year profit increase. Um, if you look at the six-month period, it's a little bit more than that. Loan problem loans continue to go away. They're getting a little bit better all the time. Um, let me just see if I can pull up this statement because the CEO says the same thing each and every quarter. <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty funny. Um, while we remain concerned about the effect of global and national issues on our local economy, we plan to continue our efforts to improve profitability by growing our loan portfolio and improving our operating efficiency. We remain confident in our ability to maintain our position as a premier independent provider of financial services in the community. It says the same thing every quarter, okay? And every quarter, they, you know, earnings are getting just a little bit better. The loan portfolio is getting just a little bit better. They took some radical steps a few years ago to dispose of non-performing assets and really cleaned the bank up. So at some point, I think somebody steps in and, and makes a bid for these guys. Okay. Uh, my buddy, uh, DP, who I grew up with in Monroe, he said what it really needs is uh, Fermi 2. 
Uh, there's Fermi One, Enrico Fermi, uh, nuclear power plant, and uh, mm. you know you get for you keep an eye on this thing, and you hear any rumblings about uh, Fermi Two. I mean, there's nothing on the docket right now, but you know that would bring five thousand jobs to the area. So uh, you know, you know, a little bit of fundamental information there. Uh, Tim, I also want to ask you. You know, we we've been talking to you here for a couple of years. You were actually one of the uh, you weren't the first guest, but you were one of the early guests on the show. And uh, you always talk about how many stocks, you know, are showing up on your scans that, uh, you know, are, are, are I, don't think you, I don't think you want to know the answer to this question. OK, uh, it's look, as the market goes higher, the list gets shorter. OK, and it, it was about a year ago that I was really like, wow, I don't remember seeing levels this low in a very long time. Uh, what's going worse? I mean, you're running the screens now, and there's seven, eight names on it. Um, we ran the tightest screen that we run uh, from a, a balance sheet margin of safety. And normally, there's about 20 stocks on the list. There were six when we ran it yesterday. Wow. So this is really – this the, the number of value stocks in the market is getting extremely small. And I was talking to somebody last night, and they said, well, how can it be? All these oil stocks are just collapsing in on themselves. they got to be trading below book value. And that's a fact. They are. But um, the only ones that pass the credit checks, period, in the whole industry right now because of the oil pricing are Chevron and Exxon. Okay. I stand corrected on that. It's Fermi 3. There already is Fermi 1 and Fermi 2. So it's Fermi 3. Don't get excited if you see there's a Fermi 2 out there. We've been on the, we've been on okay. the line with Tim Melvin. He's a Marketify maven and the author of the Tim Melvin Deep Value Letter. You're about a fundamental guy. We get on the show, so it's great. We talk all these crazy technicals that don't mean anything, but you get down there and crunch the numbers, and it's really great to get uh, your opinion on things uh you've been in the markets for nearly three decades and uh your experience shows thanks a lot tim we'll speak to you again soon guys thanks for having me on i look forward to being on again soon thanks tim